The theater has always been a primary form of live entertainment, going back to the days of Greek mythology, and it is still with us today, despite many reports of its imminent demise. Referred to as the fabulous invalid, it is still healthy, vital, and dynamic. This course will deal with how you produce a play or musical and the complex journey involved and the many people who make it happen. My name is Mike Merrick and I'm a theater producer and I will be your guide in learning some important facets of producing the play. We're fortunate in having with us today the distinguished stage and television director, Mr. Glenn Casale. Glenn is the director of many outstanding productions, most notably a first caliber production of the Tony Award nominated and Emmy winning production of Peter Pan, starring Kathy Rigby. And he, in addition to that, has done many, many, I would say easily a hundred productions of musicals and stage plays and many television shows. So he's a man of, you would say, who is multifaceted. And we're indeed glad to welcome him, Mr. Glenn Cassell. Glenn, thank you very much for being Hi, here. Hi, Mike. Nice to be here. And some of our students are here. And I guess one of the outstanding questions or complexities that even I can't answer is, what is a producer? I mean, is he a psychiatrist? <laughs> is he a guy who puts things together? Is he just a money raiser? But there are, in the classes, as you know, that we've conducted, there are many kinds of producers. There are producers who are creative, who originate an idea. Somebody comes to them with an idea or they find a book, and that means they have to start from scratch. If it's a musical, they have to find a book writer, they have to find a composer, they have to find uh, a various and sundry things. Of course, a director. And then, of course, there's a guy who just puts up money for a production. Now, he's pretty important to it, to say the least, because without the money, you don't get the show on. But he is not what we term a creative producer. He's not a hands-on individual. And then there is another individual who gets man or woman or whomever they are. A writer will come to him and say, I have this script. Would you read it? And if you like it, would you option it? Now, what is your reaction to that, Glenn, generally, those kinds of producers? Well, I think there's a couple things about the different kinds of producers you mentioned. I've worked with quite a few of all the types you've talked about. Yeah. Um, one of my favorites is a producer who gets in and is hands-on. I like that collaboration. I think that's missing in the theater today, that collaboration with a producer. I guess there's, the key word in the theater is collaborative effort. And I think that's starting to drift away. It's becoming a yeah. little more corporate. And I, and I like the producer that'll get in and argue and fight for what he sees and talk about the artistic decisions, because otherwise it leaves me on my own. And sometimes they're known as maniacs, you know. That's right. You know. I've been a few things like that in my time. <laughs> Maybe uh, we're fortunate to have some of the students from the class that I've been teaching over the last uh, couple of months, and I want to see if they have any questions pertaining to that. Uh, if they do, I'd like to address it to them, producing the play. Aaron, uh, Aaron Tuttle, who's been with the class for the last 14 weeks, is a guy who's been involved with the theater for a long time, which I, they're all graduate students, by the way. Do you have anything specific that you want to ask of Glenn or myself pertaining to the function of a producer? I was wondering what, what kind of producer you are, if you picture yourself as a creative producer or a financial producer. And if so, if you are a creative producer, how, what's your relationship like with the playwright, director, and dramaturg? Well, that's a very good question. It's a, a lengthy one. Listen, I picture myself as a creative producer, which is a nutcase for the very simple reason that it takes a long time. Most of the shows that I have done, going back to the first one I ever did, Clarence Darrow with the late Henry Fonda, you'll notice most of the people I've worked with are dead, which <laughs> I don't know what that says about me. But what you have to do is A, if you have the idea, going back to Clarence Darrow, we had to find the guy who was going to write the script. Then we had to find the right director, which we had a lot of complex problems with. How do you get a director for a one-man play? Then, of course, when I did a musical, which I did recently uh, in London's West End, Le Trek, by, uh, with a score by, <coughs> excuse me, Charles Aznavour, we had to find, it took me a year 
to find Charles Aznavour to write the correct score. What do you know about that, Glenn? I'm sure you have examples of that where it takes a long time. Yeah, I've been working on a play that's been in development for an off-Broadway show. And, you know, we're talking Broadway, we're talking the West End. Even Broadway is difficult today with producing. Uh, the whole nature of New York has changed because of, I feel 9-11 has really affected New York still. And, and people coming to the theater, especially off-Broadway. I've been working on this six-character musical for four years we've been developing it. And, you know, it's taken us from doing it in the regions and getting us to get it to off-Broadway. And just now, after four years, we're getting to do a presentation. So it's been in the nurturing stage throughout. Kevin McCullum, who produced Rent, is involved with yes. it. And we did a small production in his theater in Minneapolis and worked out some of the things, which is a lot easier than going right into the city with all the costs of Manhattan. To focus in further, that's, that's very enlightening, to say the least. But to focus in further on your very good question, Aaron, a creative producer, you better have a lot of time. You better start producing when you're 15 years old, and by the time you're 21, maybe you'll get it on. But uh, you have to put the elements together. It's definitely easier when there is a finished product handed to you. But then you still have to assemble the team. But the guy who puts up the money puts up the money, period. And then there's a guy who doesn't put up all the money, but gathers people and forms a limited partnership. And then there's a group of people that put up the money. That's right. And uh, you have to watch every one of them, too. <laughs> you know, but there are, as you know, as well as I do, that many times you have theater owners who aren't merely landlords, but they, uh, they participate fiscally in the production as well. And of course, uh, Schubert Alley, <laughs> which is between 44th and 45th Street in the center of the Manhattan Theater District, is, is I guess, truly the heart of, uh, of New York theater. But the huge posters of Broadway shows that adorn the walls of this uh, famous passageway, it makes it clear that Broadway is alive and thriving, providing nourishment for the hordes of visitors and, and New York natives who look to live theater as their sense of culture and entertainment. Now on the corner of 44th Street is the flagship theater of the Schubert Theatrical Empire. And they are the most influential force in American theater without doubt. And leading the Schubert organization is the chairman of the company, Gerald Schoenfeld, known as Jerry to his friends, who has been at the helm of this important and vital emporium of entertainment for decades. Uh, Jerry continues to be one of the most influential and pace-setting figures in the theatrical world. And we're very fortunate indeed to have him air some of his views on the varied intricacies of producing the play. If somebody comes to see us and they want us to present their show in our theaters, yes, we ask to see the script. And if it's a musical, we ask to hear a, a CD if they have one. They invite us to readings and we go. If it's out of town, we will cover it. We are interested in their budgets, interested in their cast, their director, the manager. We're interested in as much as we can find out about the show before we book it. We meet with them. We can tell them what we feel about the future of their show from a box office point of view. We will uh, discuss their budgets with them in the beginning. We really don't give creative input because, frankly, it's generally not asked for. Secondly, if we do and it's followed and it's not the right advice, we will be blamed. But uh, yes, if we see a show at a reading or we read the script, we will t give them our opinion about it. And uh, if they change it or not, it's up to them. And then, of course, our recourse is we will book it if we don't like it. Unless, of course, you have an empty theater, then you will fill it. We don't try to be a censor of a show. And, uh, Really, to this day, I don't know of any shows that have been shut out. If we give a theater to a show, it can be a commitment on our part of a million to two million dollars a year. 
which is not regarded by the producer as an investment, but it is for us because the show does not work. There's not generally a show on a railroad siding that you can just pull into the station and fill the theater. Sometimes we can't accommodate them where they wish to go. All theaters are not available at the same time. And their timetable may not fit our timetable. So uh, also, they may not be realistic in the sense of where they would like to play and uh, what they can earn in, in a particular theater. Uh, we, uh, we give them our advice on those matters. Uh, there are a number of shows right now that uh, are vying for theaters. And uh, I have to decide which ones I wish to have in our theaters, where I should think they should be presented. They may not like it. They may not like it for a number of reasons. They don't like the location of the theater. They think the theater has a second balcony and it would be less desirable. They think the configuration of the theater is not right for their show. It doesn't give the right degree of intimacy. Any number of reasons. Some of which are valid and some of which are not. They had a hit in this theater 12 years ago and uh, they are superstitious and they think that it will happen to them again. Yes, if somebody's obviously a major box office star, let's say it's Katherine Hepburn, and uh, I will ask, how long is she signed for? Well, if she signed for 16 weeks or whatever, I may be disinclined to book that show because they're carving out a period of time and I would have to book around that time. I really couldn't book in front of it unless I had a show that I knew was going to close. But it's difficult to find something when that show would close because it's unlikely that she would be replaced. So generally, to me, it's much easier to have the show as the star rather than an individual. And if I'm doing a show like uh, The Blue Room with Nicole Kidman, who was only going to do it for 14 weeks, I would have to be creative with the budget and I think see to it that people are all working for close to minimum and we would take less, but also that they would get a percentage of profits because I would expect the show to be a major hit. I would expect it to substantially sell out before it opens. So I wouldn't have certain running expenses like advertising, which is a big number every week. And, uh, but unless, unless I can get somebody uh, who's going to be a big star, Yes, I would not be interested in telling, taking somebody who has a short-term contract. A star is someone who sells tickets, hopefully in advance of the opening of the show. There may be many, many actors who are better than stars, but unfortunately, they don't sell tickets. To me, ideally, unless you got a star for a long time, the show should be the star. A stop clause is a provision in the booking contract which provides basically for the duration of the run of the show. And it says basically that if the gross weekly box office receipts fall below a certain amount for two consecutive weeks, the producer or the th theater and the or has the right to terminate the booking contract on one week's notice. Now today, Certainly, 
producers would like to protect themselves by uh, excluding from those weeks, uh, oh, let's say, uh, Labor Day weekend, that week in which Labor Day occurs, that week in which Memorial Day or July 4th occurs. So they're not counted in the consecutive weeks. And a major show came in here one day, running in one of our musical theaters. And I thought they were coming in because they were facing some tough weeks and they would like some adjustment on the rent. But they came in and they said, we we're going to put up a closing notice Sunday. They had not gone under the stop clause. But you could see what their business was going to be. So they closed. We were left with an empty theater for a long period of time. Well, I think that was very interesting for any of us who are interested or who go to the theater, for God's sakes, to see the backstage, if you will, workings of what happens. I mean, here's a man who is arguably uh, the most influential theater owner, not only in the United States, but abroad as well. He really is somebody who understands the nuts and bolts of how to make a show work and, more important, how to make a show survive. Yeah. And he's also very helpful. I'll tell you a specific instance. A number of years ago, I had a play at the Golden Theater, which is a Schubert house, mm -hmm. going back a few years, and I didn't know him then as well as I know him now. But the show got generally uh, very good reviews, except for the New York Times, which gave it one of those reviews, but this was before Frank Rich, where you needed a friend to tell you, you say, did he like it? I'm not sure. <laughs> what, what, what did he mean? And that's death. So business slumped a little bit, but he believed in the show, and he allowed us to continue at cut rate uh, uh, payments. I mean, he cut down the amount of, uh, of fees that you pay per month, et cetera, rent and everything of that nature. Very few theater owners will do that. And he enabled us to survive. We put up a provisional closing notice, which is another dramatic story. But he works with a producer. And you can't say that about many of them. No. You know, with Peter Pan, we have the Netherlanders working with us. And the same thing, the Netherlanders have theaters all across the country. And it's great to have a theater owner on your team. Of course. <laughs> My God. Once a producer, you don't get a theater until you have the elements together. I mean, when you're doing a straight play, it's infinitely simpler. We'll talk about that later on, straight play versus a musical. But right now, uh, you have to get together your, your director, your scenic designer, but the director, Glenn, has a lot to say, if not everything to say, about the scenic designer. Am I right? Right. We get to choose the design team and all the elements that we'll be working with. Sound, lights, costumes. You know, we want, with the say with the producer, you know, I, I think, again, it goes back to that collaboration. You, you, there's a handful of designers that they will put in front of you, too, that you might not know. And, you know, with me as a director, sometimes I like to meet new people. So it just inspires creativity that mm -hmm. way. So it is my choice through the producer of who I want to work with. But a producer should never, I mean, there are some producers who try, but a producer should, should never dictate, I feel, to a director and say, here's the guy I want, or here's the woman I want. That's not right. A producer may make a suggestion, but if a director is used to, has had experience with, working with a specific design, a costume, or scenic, the director has to have the right to do that. A producer that flaunts that right is making a huge mistake. What other questions? Uh, Brent, do you have a question pertaining to what Mr. Schoenfeld said? Yeah. Um, actually, I actually noticed that he uh, put a lot of emphasis on star power when it comes time to casting and um, the difference with the shows as in with Cats and uh, Phantom. Um, so as a producer, what is the importance to you to find that star name, that celebrity name, um, to get it part of the cast in the leading roles or a guest appearance? Um, for example, right now on Broadway, you have uh, The Boy From Oz with Hugh Jackman. What's the difference between that and Phantom of the Opera with Michael Crawford and all? Well, that's a very good question. I think both Glenn and I can respond to it. I'll respond to it first. All I can tell you is that Jerry Schoenfeld, in our view, brought up a very good point. When you have a show that is the star, Phantom of the Opera, Cats, Les Miserables, that he referred to, etc. It's infinitely simple. You don't have to worry and say, oh my God, what happens when the star leaves? Who do I replace him with, etc.? A star is a big draw, but it's also a detriment, right? From right. that point of view. Glenn? Right. Yeah, sometimes you get a star in a production like The Boy from Oz, and because Hugh Jackman is such a star driven vehicle, when Hugh Jackman is out, they shut the show down. They give everybody their salary, but they shut the show down for a week. 
they don't know what's going to happen in September when his contract is up. And that's the problem with a star, you know, having a star in the lead. Mm -hmm. Especially if everybody's paying a ticket to see the star. If that star is out for a night, that understudy does not go on. The guy who's covering Hugh Jackman has never gone on. So, I mean, that's, that's the problem there. So you're, it's, a, it's a balancing game. Also, the problem there is that, unfortunately, Boy From Oz did not exactly get terrific reviews. Hugh Jackman personally got raves. Consequently, if you're paying 100 bucks, which is around the going rate, to see a show and they say, oh, this evening, Hugh Jackman uh, will be replaced by Sam Greiber. You say, oh, my God, you don't want to stay. But the thing is, one of the great examples is Antonio Banderas was in the revival of Nine. Brilliant revival. Brilliant. Great. Totally different from Great. what it was originally with Tommy Toon, etc. Great. And Tommy Toon had a big hit. But this one was really done beautifully. The minute he left the show, they had a wonderful actor replace him. Terrific. John Stamos, right? Very, very good actor. Accomplished everything. But that whole star magic that Antonio Banderas created permeated the atmosphere. And business went... And you know, there's another example. One of the biggest successes in Broadway history recently is The Producers. It's a mega hit. But here's an example of where the stars and the production meld together and make it better. Matthew Broderick and Nathan Lane in The Producers is a golden ticket. The producers without those two in L.A. did not do well. In New York, when they left, the box office dipped again. Not to say they're not making their nut, but it just does show that those two in those roles make that show, and that's why they're going to be doing the movie next year. That's right. And Andrew Lloyd Webber did a brilliant, brilliant thing with Phantom of the Opera. You've got to give him a lot of credit. Besides the fact that he's a composer of note, he's a very, very clever entrepreneur. Absolutely. What he, Michael Crawford, who created the Phantom of the Opera, was absolutely outstanding. Everybody that followed him really sort of copied his style. But, but, Andrew Lloyd Webber never, never said, Michael Crawford of Phantom of the Opera. Michael Crawford was there. And so consequently, when he was replaced, besides the fact that the Phantom movies wore a mask, you never knew who was on, you know. But seriously, it was, uh, it was not a star-driven vehicle, you know. Cody? With something you said and that Mr. Schoenfeld <clears throat> said in regards to uh, receiving the script, looking at it, and saying, I want to option this or do it. One thing that they tell us here through my training as a playwright is they're not going to look at something if it tops out at a certain number of characters or more. I have a play going up in September here at the university that has more than six characters. So if I put this kind of script in front of Mr. Schoenfeld or yourself, would you even look at it? Well, I would. I'm going to refer a lot of this to Glenn from a director's point of view, but quickly from a producer's point of view, of course I'd look at it. There's no question about it. One thing, the only thing that I hesitate and I get frightened about, if somebody wants to do a musical and there were 30 characters in there, that is fiscally limiting because of today's marketplace. But six characters, for God's sakes? I mean, yes, of course I'd look at it. What if it's a straight play, though, that tops out at six characters? I mean, That's top more than six characters, let me say. Like, well, it depends on the play. Okay. I mean, to me, and, I, and again, I want Glenn to answer this, but to me, six characters is not exactly an overwhelming, unrealistic amount. Glenn? No, I, I think you get into costs. It becomes cost prohibitive if you start getting characters over 10. And today, with the marketing of a play, people don't tend to go to plays as much as they go to musicals. But I think as far as a play, I think for you, I would write what you feel. Angels in America <coughs> had so many characters. There are plays, the Kentucky Cycle had so many characters. I think that if a play speaks to the public, if the sp play speaks to a producer, or if a play has merit in our society today, everybody should look at it. It doesn't matter how many characters. So is this usually where art and commerce kind of butt heads Absolutely. in this situation? Absolutely. Well put, Tony. Okay. Well put. That's unfortunately it. And you have to rely on the individuals you're dealing with. I mean, there are some people, there are some producers, and they're not necessarily wrong, who say, oh, more than 12 people, I don't want to look at it. I don't... That's their thing. I'll look at anything. In all honesty, if somebody says to me, I have a musical here with 45 people, I'll say, oh my God, 
I would get nervous about that. But if Mike found a play that had 20 characters and he said, you know what, I love this play, I believe in this play, it's not right to jump to Broadway no. with 20 characters right away, he would find for you as an artistic producer a place to develop work it. the play out and develop it and research it and then bring in other money people, right. I would expect. Uh, yes, you're absolutely right. I, t I totally agree with Glenn. So is this where a producer and a director or just a producer has to be practical? Well, absolutely. First, you deal with the producer, then he puts together the team, which we were talking about a moment ago. You have to be practical. I mean, if it's vital for the play, you as a playwright say, I can make this play work with 10, but then if you want to dress it and expand on it and make it 16 when you really don't need it, I think it's self-defeating. But if you really need 16, any producer worth anything, creatively speaking, from a point of view of imagination and sales quality, will have to look at it, I think. You know. I agree. And the other thing today, I think, that's happened over the last 10, 15 years is Broadway has become still the mecca, but the regional theaters are really places now where we can go out and develop. You know, we used to have this slogan called, we'll go and work it out on the road. Well, the on the road now is the regional theaters. And those regional theaters are so necessary for Broadway today. That's where the whole picture has changed. Regional theaters, Glenn, again, is 100% correct. Uh, regional theaters will help you develop it. We've talked about it in class where a number of regional theaters have shops where your designer can bring in, they can build the set for you. That's their contribution. You'd be surprised, not that you would be because you know about it now, but the producer, the production company, saves a great deal of money that way. And they participate in it. You know, I developed the learn and low thing almost like being in love, which is now going out to regional theaters at the end of this year. I developed it here at UNLV. They made it possible for us to stage it, not a reading, a full workshop, workshop production, which we were able to judge audience reaction. This works, that doesn't work, etc. But regional theater is the place where you get things going. Very important. Malcolm, did you want to ask a question? Is there any other uh, reason a theater owner might uh, tell a show to leave besides money? Well, basically that is the real reason. But there have been unusual reasons, let's say a negative press, let's say some kind of misbehavior on the part of the producers or the actors or something of that nature, whether it be referred to vulgarity or whether they don't fulfill their responsibilities and they have other people waiting. But basically it is the stop clause. If you fall below, it's happened to me, and I'm sure Glenn's been involved with shows that happened to him, whereby you fall below for a couple of weeks, but if they don't have anybody waiting, if somebody is knocking on the door saying, oh, I want your theater, then they'll play ball with you, they'll go along, but if there's somebody lined up, they're not gonna be that generous. Jerry Schoenfeld is probably one of the most cooperative, besides the fact that he's the most powerful theater owner, you would think that a guy like that would be above compromise, he's not. That's why he's good for the theater. Right. You know, right, Glenn? And he wants it to succeed. Of course. You know, the, everybody going into it wants it to succeed. What has happened, though, lately is it's become about dollars and cents. Too much. Yes, so Amy? Does the theater owner have any say in anything in the show? I mean, do they have any say on how the show goes? Usually not. But let's say, hypothetically, they put up a bit of the money. Then and they see that something in the show does not appeal to them from a commercial point of view. Then they have every right in the world to say to the producer, you know something, you got that scene with the man and the woman, we just don't think it works, etc. They can't dictate to you, but they can. I would always listen to Schoenfeld. I would always listen to Jimmy Niederlander, whom we both know quite well, although he's not as active now as Jerry is. But nevertheless, if they are creative, you have to judge each case on its own. You can't say, no, I'm not going to listen to a theater owner. That's wrong. If they have something to say, you know, you have to listen to them. No question about it. Jim, yeah. Um, when, say, a new musical, new play, what have you, comes to his desk or gets submitted to him, and he said something along the lines about this not being the right play for his company, is, I mean, is it, it um, the theater today, I mean, is it a small world? Do they refer plays to other companies, or is it really kind of competitive as far as, I mean, like you talked about the regional scene or something like that, maybe this is not right. You're talking, here. About, you're talking about major theater owners in New York? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think, 
and tell me if I'm wrong, Glenn. I don't think any theater owner will say to you, it's not right for this organization. If the producer has the money, okay, and the players are half decent play, they'll go with you. There's no reason why not. It's not right for this company. We've talked about in class other areas where you're going to get regional theaters where they turn you down, where my favorite word, of course, dramaturge, mm -hmm. which a lot of them, you know, it's one of the things that sits in my craw because they make judgment predicated upon people who aren't that knowledgeable. Not all of them, but some of them. But I would venture to say, based upon my experience and, and, and yours, Glenn, that if a theater owner has the right kind of a product in front of him and he knows that the money is accessible, he's not going to uh, turn it away. Glenn? I agree. I, I, I think there's, there's, you know, <laughs> I think the theater owner getting involved like that would not say, you know what, but you should go to the Netherlanders because it would be right for them. Right. I think that's all the producer stuff. You know, the theater owner is really the landlord with some artistic control. And I think, you know, Jimmy Netherlander, even for us, he'll come in and, or whoever's working for him now, Nick. will come in and make notes on what he sees in front of him. It's going into all of his theaters all around the country. So, you know, they, yeah, and you do want to listen to them. You do want to say, you know what, maybe he's right. Maybe that scene is too long. You've you got know? to keep an open mind. Absolutely And, he, and he's right. been in the business forever, yeah. you know? Yes, sir, Aaron. When working on a play, going back to what Mr. Schoenfeld said about the, some plays are, the, the star is the play in some plays, the actor is the star. Do you try to create plays that do not have a star? You try to uh, to alter the story or the script a bit so that you don't have to run into that mistake of always having to put a star in a show. Well, that's a very constructive question, and I can give you a direct response. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the way the theater is constructed today from a commercial point of view, in order to raise the money, in order to, as Jerry Schoenfeld said, in order to get an advance, ticket sales in advance, in order to build up sales groups, etc., you need that name. Or if you do a big revival that was a hit revival, then you can get away with not having a name, probably. I mean, if Phantom of the Opera goes off in New York and it comes back in a few years, it's been playing all over the country. Again, he made that point. But if you're going to do a brand new play and it is star driven, if there is a role for one or two people, you're going to have to get a name. I'm involved at present, as Glenn knows, with doing a play in London that I did with the Royal Shakespeare Company about Christopher Marlowe called The School of Night, which was a huge hit at Stratford-on-Avon at the Barbican. We want to bring it in commercially to the West End this year. i got to have a star. Yes, Brent. Do you think it's always been that way in theater, that you have to have that star for no. the name? Or is it just now with the commercial kind of coming into theater. I, I don't, I'll, I'll be right with you. I don't think so, but I'm going to let Glenn answer that question. You Glenn? know, I don't think so either, but I think Broadway has... Now, let's talk about Broadway in, in particular. Broadway has changed where you have to go into Broadway with either a name, play, or musical, or a star, I feel, in order for it to run. And I think the names, like Phantom of the Opera, Saturday Night Fever, ran because it was Saturday Night Fever. It's that kind of thing that today, I think, either a name or a star, and sometimes even a revival. You know, I've been working the last couple of years on trying to get Camelot on, and I've been involved in that process, and we've interviewed 10, 15 major people to play the lead, and we couldn't get one. And it's still out there trying to find a star. See, I did Camelot. I was lucky. I got the original King Arthur, Richard Burton, who was with it for a year, who was on a flat, big salary in those days, no percentage, and he deserved every penny of it. First of all, he was terrific. Rest his soul. Another guy who passed away, unfortunately. Uh, but he brought the people in. You know, I worked with Richard Harris. There's a poster back there. Uh, who brought the people in. But if you have... That's why Jerry Schoenfeld's point about the property being the star is a blessing for a producer. Absolutely. Did you want to ask something, Amy? Because Yeah, how does a small producer compete with the big corporate producers like Disney these days? Well, that's tough. That's a good question. How do they compete with Disney? Disney has a lot of money, to say the least. So does Clear Channel. 
I would venture to say that Aida, even though it's been it was written by uh, uh, Elton Elton John, would not have lasted if they weren't able to sink money into it. Because at the beginning, it didn't do business. They just fed money, fed money. Am I right? Absolutely. Let, let me say something to that. I also think that today you've really got to have, the producer really has to have, no matter what the project is, a clever marketing campaign. You need to get that public in with a clever marketing campaign. So you've got Disney's marketing machine behind them. A sole producer can never compete with Disney. It's a major conglomeration that they feed their advertising into all ABC television is Disney. So they've got an instant market right there for their shows. Theme so, parks. Right. It is hard. But I think that the individual producer then just goes about it differently. And I think the individual producer has to use the regional theaters where Disney can use Disneyland. They've got Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs in development at the park. So they can dump that amount of money and develop right yeah. there in their own backyard. They don't have to run around hustling. We're gonna have to finish up. Yes, Cody, go ahead. Uh, what make to this is to Glenn, what what's an unattractive producer to you? With all these considerations they have to make, what is an un, what is an unattractive producer to you? You know what I feel about that? I feel the only time I've really gotten into trouble with a producer is when a producer only cares about money. Absolutely. Right. Doesn't care about the artistic process, doesn't care about what's up on that stage. Then that's a bad producer to me. I couldn't agree with him more. As a producer, I'll tell you right now, I would never do that. I'm interested in money, too. But if it's not on that stage, you're not going to make any money. You've got to work with your creative people. And we're going to get into, a little bit now, about talking about the difference between straight plays, how you put that together, as opposed to a musical. I think that is an interesting aspect to explore for all of us. One of the really vital questions uh, within the framework of theatrical enterprises are the basic differences between straight plays and musicals. Not only as far as cost is concerned, I mean, we all know that a musical costs more, for obvious reasons, than a straight play. But how do you put them together? What is the time involved, you know? I think Glenn Casal, as a director of both forms, can really start off this conversation in a very constructive fashion, Glenn. Yeah, um, you know, starting with a musical, it's interesting, I've done, most of my career has been directing musicals. I do straight plays too, but the musical for me, I enjoy the form. In working on a musical, though, a musical takes so long to develop because you find a piece, whatever the seed is of the piece, if you're developing a new musical, you find the seed of the piece. Will that seed sell? Does that seed sing? Sometimes people will bring to me just the idea, I found this book. Do you think this will be a musical? So then you start working at it. What would the songs, how would it sing? Uh, you know, Scarlet Pimpernel was on Broadway a few years ago. It started from that novel the novel The Scarlet Pimpernel. They got Frank Wildhorn, who's pretty hot on Broadway right now. He did Jekyll and Hyde. He wrote the music for Jekyll and Hyde. He's got a new uh, production coming out next year of Cyrano. And again, he writes those big sweeping scores. So you've got to get the seed and then find somebody who can write the right music to make that story work. So it's a lot more complicated, I think, in development oh boy. over the years. No you know, question. Back and forth. It's a, it's a young man's job because uh, I won't do it anymore because it takes too long. Did you want to ask a question, Cody? Yeah, you, you were saying that you found, uh, you, you have to find the right person for each thing. How do you do that? <laughs> well, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways. I try to go whenever I can and see new works, new musicals. There's a lot of, in New York, one of the biggest things today for producers is they do readings, stage readings, where people just sit in chairs like you are, holding the scripts, they play through the music. Sometimes the actors will do the book and the authors of the music and the lyrics will sing the show for them, which I've been involved with a lot, where we've done these, I call them dog and pony shows, where we're trying to sell our product. And again, like this show Bingo I've been working on, it's been four years. We've had readings and showcases and productions for six weeks, and then we've changed it and rewritten it. And the producer was very involved in all that. Notes all the time about what will better it, what will help it succeed in the commercial market. So That's a key phrase, notes. One second, notes. Producer, creative producers, which we haven't talked about, you know, after rehearsals or after a production, I would say, a show, a director will always go on stage 
and hand out notes to the various of sundry members of the cast. You didn't do this right, I want you to do that, etc., etc. Or give notes, or talk about notes. Also, in keeping with that kind of an approach, a creative producer will sit down with his creative team, with the directors afterwards, and give notes, verbally or otherwise, and say, listen, that second scene doesn't work, etc. We have to get it out. I've just been through it. So I know all about it. All producers or creatives should be through it. But it's a young man's game from the point of view it takes a long time. Example, you've heard me talk about Vive La Vie, which was called the Trek when it opened on the West End with a score about, by Charles Asdabor, uh, about to lose the Trek. The idea came to me through a close friend of mine who, had, who was a lawyer, who had a client who kind of abandoned it, was going to do something about it. He wanted to do Moulin Rouge, the picture, not the recent one. Many years ago, there was a picture with Jose Ferrer, which was not a musical. It had one song in it. He wanted to get the rights to that and do it for the stage. And I said, I think it's a good idea. Well, to make a long story digestible, we went through it. MGM, who owned the rights, wanted $10 million a minute for it. I mean, it was ludicrous. I'm saying it as a joke. But they wanted something that was absolutely untenable. So we said, wait a minute. Why do we need Moulin Rouge? We're talking about Toulouse the Trek. Toulouse the Trek is public domain. Let's find somebody to write a book, a story about Toulouse the Trek, and somebody to write a score. So that's when a creative producer starts working. It took me, I hate to tell you this, about two years to find the right composer. I found a writer, first of all, a friend of mine, uh, who wrote an original version which didn't work out for whatever reasons that was. But I went through, I thought to myself, got to get a French composer, right? I went to Maurice Jaw. You may know who he is. A very famous, well-known, active composer for the screen. He wrote Lawrence of Arabia, to give you an example. All these marvelous, staggering, overwhelming, lush scores. But I met with him. He wanted to do it, and I realized the man had no frame of reference to the theater. And I went through, I met with Marvin Hamlisch, who was a brilliant composer. He didn't want to do it, and he was right. It wasn't his genre, his thing. And then my wife said to me, what about Charles Aznavour? I said, oh my God, I never even thought of it. Well, I called his agent, who I fortunately knew. One, two, three, sometimes these things happen. She called me, she said, he's interested in it. Can you meet him in New York next week? I said, I'm on a plane. Met him in New York, boom, he was involved right away. Then he worked with the book writer, which as I said a moment ago, that didn't work out. We had to get another book writer. And we decided to do it in England. Why? Costs. To have done that show, this is just about three years ago, to have done that show in New York would have been almost twice the amount of money. So we did it in London. Of course, at that time, there was a situation. You've got to get involved with the politics of theater as opposed to the theater of politics. But the politics of theater in London at that time, it was, uh, it was a whole thing of francophobia and a lot of the press didn't go for it, etc. We're doing it again. But to get back to it, it took us a long time to put the elements together. Then I got a director, wonderful director, a British director named Rob Bettinson, who did a very successful show in London called Buddy Holly Story. And then he also did the Jolson story. And he put it together and he picked a team of scenic designer, costume designers. As a matter of fact, the scenic designer he picked had some ideas that I thought were weird and way out. People coming in on trapezes. And I sat there, I had a partner of mine, and Arthur Price is his name. And we sat there and we said, is the guy crazy? Well, he wasn't crazy. He was right. That's why a creative producer has to say to a director, hey, what do you think? You do it. Pick it. Do what you want. It's a long process. And then, of course, a director picks the choreographer. Go ahead, Glenn. I mean, you talk about it, don't yeah, you? Yeah, a lot of times, you know, we'll, we'll sit down and then think, uh, you know, I've been asked this a lot of times. They say to me, who do you like using as a choreographer? Well, like anything else, like Mike was talking about Charles Aznavour to, to work on Lautrec, you look at a choreographer that's right for the project. All choreographers aren't right for all projects, just like all directors are not right for all projects, etc. So I look at choreographers, if it's a tap show, I know people who do tap. If it's an interesting, creative show that's going to be more Cirque du Soleil form, I've got people who do that. If you want to 
pizzazzy Las Vegas show, we've got people who do that. And I look at different people, the choreographers, and really try to pick each of them, not only choreographers, set designers, lighting designers, of teams that work on that project that I think will make that project work. Um, I'm going to redo Beauty and the Beast now, and it was a tough time finding a design team to recreate that without using Disney's ideas. We'll use the script and music, but it's got to be all redesigned, yeah. costumes and sets. Jim, did you want to ask a question? I'm wondering if you could, on the flip side, uh, talk about uh, maybe some details or maybe even a hypothetical about getting a new play, a straight play, up and running as a producer. Well, to get a straight play up and running, as both Glenn and I said originally, is infinitely simpler because you're not dealing with so many elements. You're not dealing, you don't have to worry about what we didn't even mention. You don't have to worry about orchestrations or the arrangements, choreographers, etc. You just have to worry about the cast, the words, and as he said before, and we talked about many times, marketing it, key element. So you sit down, and if you like a play, one thing you have to watch out for, once you get a director, and it doesn't happen that much anymore, but I'm quite sure Glenn knows about this. There have been a number of playwrights, well-known and some not so well-known, who said, don't touch a word, sacrosanct. I'm not going to change a thing. Well, either you say to them, either you work with a creative team, because this is a collaborative creative process, or forget it. And some of them will be stupidly obdurate. It's ludicrous. There are still writers of that nature that exist. Don't work with them, because it has to be a process, you know? And, it's, uh, and you get it together that way, right, Glenn? Yeah, I, I believe that too. I, I mean, I've had a writer, I, I was working on a play about Ethel Waters' life, a jazz singer in the 20s. Her drug abuse and her involvement with this white uh, bar owner and what it led to, tragic. Um, and she ended up on the Cotton Club stage and singing Stormy Weather and, and becoming famous. And that was the journey of the play, but the play had problems. We were in Dallas for seven weeks working on this play. Everybody was saying, we've got to fix this script. No changes. Wouldn't change. Wouldn't write it. The producer pulled it. We were Absolutely. supposed to run 10. We were supposed to come into L.A. Producer pulled it. I mean, you have a right to fight for your words. You have a right to fight for your theme. You have to have the courage of saying, no, you're ruining my play, etc. But you also have a responsibility to listen and to be pliable and to work something out. Because what a playwright, especially a new playwright, has to understand is the director and the people he's working with usually are very well-rounded as far as experience is concerned. They know what they've been through. They've been wounded before. I mean, one of the things on the track, which is a musical with the second scene, it was my fault. It was awful. It slowed up everything. It took place in a nightclub called Le Militon. I wanted them to throw it out. All they did is they tweaked it, they shaded it. They, it ended up being a different version. Instead of saying, out, start a new, just one scene. I'm not saying it ruined the play, but it was bad. It never should have happened. You got to be firm. You have to be on this. You have to work together, be collaborative. Can That's I speak to that too? I, I think, Jim, the other way to get a play done is to really have star driven. I mean, this guy brought a play to me in mid-80s and at that time I was not going to be a director I was going to act for television so I was in LA and he said I want you to direct this play it's called Wrestlers he had had a hit on Broadway called Mass Appeal so now we're doing this play called Wrestlers and I said you know what I'm really not directing I really am out here now to be an actor he said it's going to have Mark Harmon and George Clooney in the leads well right away I was interested because I knew of the attention it would get now here's an interesting thing, that playwright then has to go in and he has to alter that play for those personalities. Not a lot, but it's George Clooney and Mark Harmon. And they bring their own skills to it and again it goes back to the collaboration. That's why I think it's hard, just to get back to musicals for a second, when, a, when a, one person writes the book music and lyrics, that's something I try to stay far oh away from. Uh, absolutely. I want to comment on it. I'll get to you in a second, Cody. I, I know you want to say something. He is so right. When you've got an individual who writes a book, music, lyrics, and then sometimes wants to direct, and that happens, well, who do you argue with? 
Do you argue with yourself? A director should be open to constructive, creative, meaningful arguments. Right. Wait a minute, Glenn. I don't agree with you. I don't think that. So what does he do? Argue with himself? Gee, I shouldn't do that. What do you mean I shouldn't do that? Back and forth, etc. He is so right. You have to divide up those things. I'm also not in favor of having choreographers slash directors. There are exceptions to the rule, but I've been burned a couple of times with a guy who's a choreographer who's also the director. Never really works. I mean, you know, of course. Michael Bennett, you want to go back to that? Bob Fosse. You know, I mean, Jerome Robbins. But they're, Jerome Robbins, but they're unusual. They're geniuses. Most people aren't. Cody, you wanted to ask a question? <clears throat> yeah, you guys both use words, the word find, find. You know, I have to go find this person. I have to find the right person. Are you ever solicited <laughs> by someone? Oh, yeah, okay. definitely. I'm Absolutely. sure you are. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Not That's a good question. I mean, though, I'm talking about actors, directors, costumers, costumers costume designers, all that. Well, Actors, directors, etc., would solicit, to use your phrase, a producer, when they know that you have a definite production in work. You know, then they'll say to you, gee, I'd like to uh, do the design on this or something of that nature. Invariably, a producer would say, fine, you'll have to meet with my director. You don't say, yes, okay, you're hired, without telling you, that's, that's awful. Just like you don't, if you have something, a producer, a creative producer, thinks a director is doing something wrong, tell them in private. Don't ever make the mistake, because a producer should never do that, as right as he or she may be. To talk to a director, let's say you're sitting in on a, on a, on a rehearsal, and something is really not going well. For a producer to say, oh my God, that's terrible, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it happens. I know. You know, what you do is later on you say, as they say in England, can I have a word? Yeah. The minute you hit, can I have a word, whoops. So you do it privately. You do it that way, and that way you work together as a team. And then you sit down and have uh, meetings with a creative team. Sometimes it turns into arguments, but you have to do that. Don't be afraid to speak up. Never say, oh, I should have said, oh, why didn't I? Forget it. Yes, Brent. Back to the uh, musical and, and the play versus each other. Um, a lot of community theaters, regional theaters across the country have seasons of all musicals. Why do you think it's gone that way that a lot of theaters do all musicals and don't try to take the challenge of a play? You really hit a very sensitive spot with that question. Because they know that revivals, I think you're talking about revivals, will make money. Because they're afraid to take a shot. They don't want to take a chance. They want to make sure that the coffers of the box office are filled to capacity at all times. Consequently, to develop a new work, especially a new musical, is murder. Because you will find, thank God, some people will say, yes, I'd like to do it now. If you bring them a brand new musical, and we were talking yesterday in class, and you say, Jennifer Lopez is going to do it, they'll say, terrific! They don't need, we don't have to read it. We don't want to listen to it. We'll do it. Well, that is not really the constructive creative. Nobody says anything negative about Jennifer Lopez. She's a big attraction. But nevertheless, nobody's looking at the quality of the work. Will we engender some kind of a, a feeling of uh, positiveness? Will the people in the commercial entities, whether it be New York or San Francisco, come and say, yes, we want to do that? Will HBO buy it for a special, et cetera, you know? I think theaters have taken a big hit over the last 10, 15 years as far as dollars and cents. We, you know, the, the American public has gotten more tight with what they're going to spend their dollars on. So they want to know going into the theater that they're going to go in and buy something that they're comfortable with, that they know. Now Mike and I have had this discussion that yes, theaters have to live off of these musicals for their bread and butter. But why can't they, and I work with a lot of theaters across the country, that leave one slot open for that development slot. Which is great because we need development today. There's no new product. And that, that's the key, and that's what we've been talking about, that if the theaters would just leave that one slot open and every year dedicate that that's, that's right. going to be the new show, you can also educate your audience to that, that there's an excitement to that. But that takes a smart producer and a, a producer who doesn't want to be safe for the whole year. I'll tell you another area. We're sitting in one right now. This is the University of Nevada, Las Vegas. There are a countless number of universities throughout the country 
that can develop new works and should develop new works. And one of the real reasons for doing this show, and doing a number of them hopefully in the future, is to try to educate various and sundry theater departments throughout universities in America what it takes to get on a show, whether it be a straight play or a musical, all the various complexities involved with it. Because universities have a responsibility to do some new works. UNLV is blessed with a wonderful theater in the Judy Bailey, one of the best theaters around. And they should do more new works. They've been very good to me where we've done two new things here. We did a play with Marriott Hartley about four or five years ago uh, called Silver Buckles on His Knee, which we weren't able to develop. It was too serious. They didn't want to touch it. And now we're doing a show that we are developing. We're going ahead with uh, almost like being in love, which started here at UNLV, you know? So uh, there are so many things that theater have to look to. Where do we go next to develop this? Universities are wonderful. Duke University in Carolina was a theater that developed a lot of Neil Simon's works years ago because the, his producer of note, Manuel Eisenberg, a damn good producer, went to Duke and he was able to do that and utilize it, etc. So we, there's a lot to talk about, there's a lot to do. And uh, in just in closing, I just want to say that uh, I hope universities will look to the creative and daring aspects of it. They have a right to be daring. They have a responsibility to be daring instead of just adhering to the status quo. I'd like to thank the students for coming and I'd like to extend a very special thanks to my friend Glenn Casal for joining us today and giving us his uh, really constructive, creative and experienced views which I think could be terribly helpful because uh, there are producers and producers and the directors and directors and we're blessed he's the, one of the best, he really is. So uh, we hope you've all enjoyed and were uh, somewhat informed about the uh, various facets of what it takes to produce a play. This is just really a minimal view of the many aspects and uh, to learn about another creative, uh, uh, meet creative professionals in the future. And in speaking with that, I think we owe a special vote of thanks to the Schubert Organization and to Jerry Schoenfeld for coming on and giving us the uh, benefit of his value, valued experience. So we hope that you will join us in future classes and about what it takes to get it, as they say, from the page to the stage in front of audiences and uh, the countless uh, number of steps needed to make a play a reality. That will be the, the core of our future video classes. And we hope you'll all join us. And thank you.